And good evening. Uh, I'm Benjamin Morgan, the Chief Executive of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia, and I welcome you to our Facebook Live broadcast for this uh, Thursday, the 6th of August. Uh, tonight, uh, we are discussing Central Coast Airport here in New South Wales, uh, otherwise known as Warnervale Airport, uh, and a battle which has been running uh, between the airport community and the council for some time. Uh, recently, there's been some fantastic news um, released uh, that the New South Wales government is looking towards rescinding uh, this thing called the Warnervale Airport Restriction Act, which has restricted the airport's uh, use and the number of uh, aircraft uh, that can use the facility or the frequency of the aircraft that can be used. Uh, and with news that that's about to be uh, pulled out, it now is starting to unlock a whole new future for the central coast, aviation on the central coast. So this evening I am joined by the following people. I have Andrew Smith. Uh, Andrew is the general manager of the Central Coast Aero Club, uh, and uh, he has been right front and centre on this issue now for a number of years. So welcome, Andrew. Hi, guys. We've also got, <laughs> we also have Michael Allen, who is one of the directors of the Central Coast Aero Club. So thank you very much, Michael, for giving up some time tonight. Hi, Ben. Good day, everybody. And Councillor Greg Best. I've had a little bit to do with Councillor Best over the last few years, and uh, I'm thankful, Councillor, that you've been able to make some time uh, to speak with us here this evening. My pleasure, Ben. My pleasure, mate. Okay, so the format for these uh, discussions is to have an open and candid conversation, a casual conversation about the issues at hand. Uh, the conversation is certainly not an attack on anyone, so we'll try and keep it all uh, as polite. But I am enthused to have this conversation tonight because we are having a breakthrough uh, on the Central Coast at the airport. And maybe the best place to start, Andrew, is to get a bit of an overview of uh, the challenge that has been evolved or has been presented at the Central Coast uh, and what the War Act has meant for the Aero Club and users. Yeah, well, thanks, yeah, Ben. Thanks, um, ben. The War Act was um, put in place way back in the, in the mid-90s, in 96. Um, it was basically put in place uh, after a, a bit of a fair campaign from a local anti-airport lobby group and... Uh, it was, it was a unique act. Uh, it was quite bizarre and, and poorly written, which was picked up by the reviewers, actually. Um, and it had some clauses in there which, were, were they activated, would create huge problems for any airport users. So um, a few years back, I mean, the act, the act was always a problem, but um, a few years back, one of the clauses was uh, enacted, which limited aircraft movements to 88 movements a day. Now, a movement was classified as a takeoff and or a landing. So essentially, it was 44 circuits, uh, and, a, and a busy aero club like ourselves could hit that in a couple of a couple of hours each morning. So, um, it would have crucified our business and probably sent us broke. So it was it was uh, we're sort of in desperate times there, uh, and we showed that we weren't overly happy about that. Uh, we had various meetings with council and, and went to a few council meetings um, and uh, Councillor Best was, was great in recognising the, the fear that we had and um, state government stepped in and, and, and looked at the concern in the community and, and decided to have another look at the Act and uh, the end result is um, they've seen how unique and, uh, and bizarre this Act is and, and have decided to repeal it. We were mainly concerned with the aircraft movement side of it um, but the Act is a bit of an outlier, so I think it was um, a sensible decision by the State Government to remove the Act entirely. And so, Andrew, I think uh, I actually grew up for a portion of my life uh, at Tookley on the Central Coast, and my father worked for the Wyomshire Council, and I remember uh, being young and being around aviation. The airport was always of a particular interest in our household, and I can remember uh, my father's frustrations with the fact that the airport seemed to be uh, kind of locked in this situation where the council didn't really know whether it wanted to activate it, but yet there was, uh, and I can remember it very vividly, there was quite a strong and powerful lobby against the airport. And I think at one stage there was this real misinformation campaign run that the aviation industry wanted to be running 747s or something out of the central coast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that keeps coming back time and again, but... Um, uh, you know, 96 was a little bit before my time in aviation, but um, uh, the records are all there and, and there was various meetings where uh, 747 jet transport, 24-7 operations would be operating out of the airport. Um, now, if anybody knows how it's geographically constrained and its location with respect to Sydney and Newcastle, um, it's fairly obvious that that is an absolute joke, really. 
that that could ever happen. Uh, there's no economic case for it. Geographically, it can't happen. And these days, it's totally constrained by um, environmental state legislation and council legislation as well. Um, so it was never going to happen. But the Act got in place on the back of that fear campaign. Um, and look, I have to say that um, the Central Coast residents in general are so pro-airport. Uh, we always suspected they were, but it wasn't until we had a bit of a petition run last year um, over some concerns we had that we saw how pro-airport they were. Um, the review came back with over 75% of respondents in favour of the Act uh, removal. Um, and that was whether or not you looked at the, um, the pro rata forms. Um, it was overwhelmingly positive in terms of removing the Act. And uh, I think uh, the anti-airport lobby is a very small group of very vocal people. And I think I'll, I'll steal um, from Councillor Best, one of his best terms, uh, the crowd in a phone box, which uh, I've heard him use in the past. And, and honestly, that's um, a perfect term to use. So um, they're a small group that are almost religious in their anti-airport sentiment. And um, uh, I think uh, the Central Coast has won out of this decision. Now, Michael, uh, obviously, what, uh, director of the Aero Club. The Aero Club has been around uh, on the Central Coast for some time. Uh, I guess in, in terms of a national context, the club is one of our long-lasting clubs uh, that has been supporting general aviation. I mean, the Central Coast is absolutely prime. It is really prime to be providing flight training services. And whilst we've got a COVID-19 pandemic going on, I mean, the Central Coast really could be taking advantage uh, of flight training and creating huge career uh, prospects for young people coming out of, I think there's like 13 to 18 schools on the Central Coast. Yeah, that's that's correct. Ben. Um, I mean, we live very happily there under current levels of operation for years with that act hanging over our head. Um, it's, it's triggering what really just an accident when council uh, uh, lengthened the runway by a fraction uh, and the Department of Planning took the view that the Act had been triggered. Then, ridiculously, levels that had never been in place uh, for years and years were suddenly dropped on us, as Andrew said, which would severely curtail our operation. I mean, we've got an unenviable record for safety at that era. Uh, uh, the perfect record, actually, in aviation, which is, which is unheard of. Um, we've got a lot of students from Sydney, and we've got the capacity to... to uh, uh, put forward or, or enable a skill opportunity for a lot of our Central Coast uh, young students and young people. Well, I know the Central Coast is not without its uh, challenges and uh, I was looking up some of the statistics on the Central Coast. And there are some statistics which really the Central Coast shouldn't pride itself on and some of them are that it has some of the highest uh, youth unemployment uh, and has some of the highest youth crime uh, statistics of any region, which uh, is really disappointing. And I, you know, I reflect... Uh, Andrew and um, Michael on the presentation we participated in with the council in which I said, you know, as a young person growing up on the Central Coast, I just wanted to be involved in aviation. And yet the problem was I had this local airport and aside from the Aero Club, it really looked like the development of the airport had been stopped, that the, the council really wasn't supporting general aviation businesses in engineering and parts and supply and so on and so forth, it, it, it put the brakes on it. Will we now see, is this the future we're now looking towards, Andrew? Are we looking towards a future where we'll see a stronger general aviation participation and the doors opening up for businesses to bring themselves to the Central Coast and start providing young people with those technical and skilled trades? Um, yeah, look, I think um, that's a good question, Ben. And I think this um, Act removal allows for uh, council to take a better look at the Warnervale site and see how they can activate um, an area that can contribute to education, <coughs> skills training, uh, skilled employment. I mean, the northern parts of the Central Coast have some of the highest um, youth unemployment in Australia um, and, and Warnervale Airport smack bang in the middle of that. Um, there's a lot of land there that's not, not being utilised. Now, I know there's a lot of concern in the community about um, the cons conservation of the surrounding wetlands and E2 environmental corridors around the airport. But there's a lot of land already um, within the fenced airport boundary that could be utilised um, in a uh, an ecologically sound way that can contribute massively to helping the unemployment problems in the region. So um, I guess Councillor Best um, would be able to answer these questions better than me, but I think Council 
um, are in a good position now to look at how they can activate the site um, for aviation purposes to help the future of the Central Coast. <laughs> Probably a great time that we now cut across to Councillor Best. I mean, he's a man that needs very little introduction on the Central Coast. I read, I read an article the other day, uh, Councillor. It said something about your you've never provided such as a, a dull day from a single council meeting. And I have to say, I've attended a few council meetings where you've uh, very passionately advocated for your constituents. Uh, maybe a, a good opportunity to get your reflection on how we got into this mess. Uh, obviously. The difficulty there has it has been to, to mount the challenge against it, and where we look that we're, I guess where it looks like we're heading. Well, gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity, and um, you you throw a few stones in the glass house, Ben, because uh, whilst I may generate a lack of dullness, if it weren't for you three champions that have come to the table, you know, and the board, uh, um, uh, Andrew, we wouldn't have gone anywhere. And Ben, you've been at the lectern at council and taken a a sheer battering from some of these extreme views that we've seen that have wed themselves to an 80s view around airports. I mean, they talk about 747s landing at uh, at Warnervale. I mean, they would have led us to believe that A380s would land there as well. So it's just the nonsense what's been going on. It, it really has been quite sad and has been literally a case of the tail wagging a dog. Um, and, and you're right, it's a crowd in the phone box that's been doing that. And it, here we are, a little bit of light at the, the tunnel with... Minister Stokes' announcement to go into this review um, with the uh, the eminently qualified uh, Abigail Goldberg, who was the reviewer. 939 submissions came in, and I'm sure quite a number of your listeners may have put forward their views. 75% of those, the overwhelming majority, said that the War Act was a dinosaur um, and that it had to go. I mean, something we all didn't realise, of course. But the bleeding obvious is not obvious to, to those that are, are trying to wag the dog. So here we are, 2020, Newcastle, a million people, Sydney, five and a half million, Central Coast sits right between the two. Goodness knows what the future could be for aviation on the Central Coast. I mean, you, I mean I'm not going to lecture anybody here tonight. There are that many eminently qualified aviators out there that, that have got some glimmer of what the future of Warnervale could mean among the largest capital and the largest non-capital city in the country in Australia is Warnervale. It's on top of the freeway. We know that freeway ultimately, if you look at some of the US examples, will be a corridor for unmanned vehicles eventually, um, whether they be delivery vehicles in the first instance and what they'll be in the future, who knows. But this kind of an asset with short-sighted, introspective, pol politically paralysed people at the helm has nearly been lost. And if it weren't for the Aero Club and Andrew and yourself, Ben and others, this would never have come to pass where we are. Having said that, we won't beat our chests too quickly here, ladies and gentlemen, because on Monday night, I'll be sitting in this very room uh, arguing a range of issues around where to from here with this council. Now, this council is doing everything, as you would imagine, conceivably available to itself to wriggle its way out the back door of a finding they never wanted to hear. We've got a $450,000 master plan for this airport. One to five, um, didn't go anywhere near the Warnervale Act to damage it or to change it or contravene it, and it still wasn't able to be put out on public exhibition for the public to give their views on it. This council was terrified of the answer. They've got the answer on the War Act review, 75% saying, it's got to change. It's just a, a ridiculous document generated uh, 25 years ago. But here we are. This council won't put on public exhibition. I've done five rescission motions. That's a national historic first of attempts by anyone to try and get a council to reconsider its position. And this council still is intransient on putting out a, a half a million dollar document to its public for their feedback. Just their feedback, but they won't do it. And I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the. I think I, in one of the council meetings, I called it their half billion dollar baby. Um, the this report that the council had uh, sought to obtain was professionally compiled by external consultants, and it looked at what both the economic and the employment opportunities would be for the Central Coast if the Central Coast took a, a fairly broad uh, review of 
I guess the value of the Central Coast Airport in being developed as a aviation hub, uh, and I have to say that at the time when we uh, initially when that happened, we were approached ourselves um, by the consultants seeking to understand our views and opinions. And I have to say, we were all really excited. We felt that this was a real moment in the history of the Central Coast Airport in that everybody kind of realises that Sydney's becoming too expensive to base your aviation business. Uh, and it was logical that these businesses were going to have to find a home either to the south, uh, to the west or to the north. And so... You know, those of us within the industry bodies and associations, we're all really nodding saying, this makes a lot of sense. I can see a lot of businesses wanting to move. Uh, and so, you know, it must be frustrating as a councillor of the Central Coast Council that you see council getting behind initiatives to see universities kind of set up camp in the council's backyard, to see other uh, industry groups and bodies brought to the Central Coast to try and develop the Central Coast focus for tourism and other trades and sectors. But here we have what was clearly a roadmap to real success and it was hidden in that bottom drawer out of public view. Look, it, it, it's, the, it's, the holy, it's the holy grail of going forward for our employment precinct. Uh, for the viewers that are listening out there, it's multi-layered, but I'll try and nutshell it as best I can. There's a, an area out there called the WES, the Warnervale Employment Zone. The Warnervale Employment Zone is the heartthrob of employment future for the region. That's it. It is the beating heart of employment for the future. What is the catalyst for the WES? Warnervale Airport Hub is the catalyst for the WES. It's not rocket science. It's quite simple. That's where it sits. Our specialists, our bureaucrats, anyone you talk to tells you the heart of the WES, the key employment precinct, the beating heart of it is the airport hub. I'm the general manager of one of the largest employers of youth on the coast. I employ over 200 apprentices and trainees with my other hat on when I'm not a councillor. And, and I don't need to tell anyone on the Central Coast just how hard it is for a kid to get a go. It's not because no one wants to, it's just so hard to do. And here we have, I've, I've got a motion coming up, as I mentioned on Monday night, it's titled War Act Repeal and importantly, declassification of airport contract damages. Because many of your listeners might have heard the sorry, sorry saga of AAI. And AAI, um, an organisation which I'm sure we're going to hear more about, um, had a contract with council to go forward with aircraft maintenance and manufacture. It was going to be a catalyst for the Warnervale Airport hub and indeed the WES. What did this council do? It came to power um, 2016, was it? 16? I can't count my years, it's gone so much. Um, they tore the contract, the binding contracts, they tore them up and they paid damages. They just said, well, we don't want you. You've got a binding contract with us, but we're so professional, we're going to tear the piece of paper down the middle. How much do we owe you? We've got the checkbook out and the pen. How much do we owe you? And by the way, they're spending someone else's money, so it's not too hard to ask that question. Bet you if it was your own pocket, they'd have a different question. But nevertheless, the millions of dollars that they've cost the ratepayers needs to be needs to be put on the table, and I intend to do that on Monday night. It's worse than that, folks, because there were 17, 17 bona fide and fleshed out serious expressions of interest that were on the ground to go on the ground at the Warnervale Airport hub, along with AI and the good work that the Aero Club does right now, and they are extinguished as well. This has cost the ratepayers of the Central Coast tens of millions of dollars, maybe more, and they've hidden it under the, seek of, the, the, the cloak of confidentiality. Well, I, for one, on Monday night want this contract damages to go out just so the public can see. I know this podcast is not here to point fingers. I want to point the truth. And these people can't handle the truth quite clearly. And the public needs to know because if they're going to go around burning cash like this, somebody else's cash, they need to be held accountable. Well, councillor, it's often uh, the difficulty with these particular situations is that these side issues then start to infringe on the good work that's been done by the existing aviation uh, businesses and tenants. Absolutely. And I know if I ask Andrew and Michael the direct question, uh, what would the Central Coast Airport look like today if the council had made available $10 million of direct investment to improve overall facilities to make general aviation and recreational aviation at the site 
uh, more productive. I think they'd, they'd both be going, well, look, absolutely, Ben, it would be amazing. Which brings me to the question that is, obviously, as we're moving forward and council, you're going to be putting a motion before the council on Monday and you, you're also seeking some support for that. But Andrew and Michael, once we, once we move forward to this position where this War Act is finally gone, and I think we all generally agree that it was actually really bad for Warner Vale and it's, it's hurt aviation badly at the, uh, at the airport site, what is aviation going to look like as we move forward beyond the war act, Andrew. Um, so, I think, um, as I said before, that this really gives um, the council the opportunity to see what the public wanted, uh, which was the, the repeal of the war act, um, and allow for them to have a closer look at what can happen at the airport site. So, um, uh, Councillor Best mentioned the um, the master plan. Uh, that was a staged plan from one through to seven. Um, from Right from the early days, I think most people recognise that six and seven of those stages were a bit too expansive. It uh, wouldn't work for the Central Coast. Um, we've always, from the Aero Club point of view, have always pushed for a solution that would allow for limited, sensible development of the airport site within the current fence boundary. Um, there's a hell of a lot we can do with that without upsetting the surrounding conservation land because we know that's an issue for some of the local residents. Um, but um, having just the Aero Club on the site, you know, we've got a monopoly there, if you like, so fantastic. But um, it's it's there's so much more that we can be done for the Central Coast on that site without um, creating issues for the surrounding conservation land. And um, you could use this master plan, I guess, as a catalyst for that to look at how we can achieve that uh, without causing problems for any of the, um, the surrounding residents. Obviously, uh, Michael, uh, I, moving forward, what's going to be critical is to transition out of the, I guess, the challenge response phase, which has been the fight to bring about some sensibility with council. I mean, how important is it going to be now to move forward in building a real working partnership with council so that we can start not only as a broader industry, uh, and a local aviation community, and of course, as a business on the airport, but how can we work together to create real aviation success in that partnership? Well, I think we can work with council, and that's what we want to do, um, Ben. Um, we've always appreciated the support of the councillors who, who, uh, <coughs> so who support us within the council, and Councillor Best is one of those. Um, we've always appreciated their support. We need to convince council that um, we can make more of this airport. As we said, we there's an opportunity to provide skilled employment on the airport without taking this, this airport outside its general aviation profile. Uh, we know there are many businesses who would locate there tomorrow, and some of them were the questions of interest that Councillor Best referred to. Um, they would provide an ideal opportunity for, uh, for uh, employment on the coast for our youth. Uh, with another hat on, I'm a director of a charity called Engineering. Uh, that charity makes uh, uh, solutions available for schools, local schools, to allow their students to build under supervision an experimental aircraft like an RB12IS. We've already got this thing running in Queensland. The kids are hugely enthusiastic about it, uh, and they come in and they learn of the aviation industry. Uh, and then they can learn to fly in that aircraft uh, under the Casper rule. It makes a whole new, um, it gives a whole new exposure to students to the aviation world. And we'd like to have one of those projects at Warnerbar, but we need an airport here to do it. Councillor, uh, obviously the Aero Club's very clear. The future is one that is that is most certainly needing to be based on having a strong, productive working partnership with the council. Can this be achieved? Look, I only hope it can. This is my 25th year serving my community and I've made a lot of mistakes and I've got a lot to learn. Um, and I've read about six or seven councils in my time. I, I hate to say it, but I, I really do um, have grave concerns that this council uh, will be the vehicle that will take us forward. Um, I, I, we have an election in September 21, September, and, um, you know, they're testing at the best of times, but the public have got to engage. They've, they've got to light up and own 
own their region, own their airport, own their beautiful central coast, and not just let, you know, this be left to people that can, you know, bludgeon and badger their way through their party machines into council and, you know, be wagged by the dog at the head of their, their party. And, you know, it, it's, it's the people at the airport that I'm beholden to. It's the people at the sports club I'm beholden to, the people at the surf club. I am an independent. I am not beholden to anyone in Macquarie Street or in Canberra. But unfortunately, the way the structure goes, and I understand this is a political exercise, you know, lecture I'm giving now, and I'm sorry, I apologise, but the, the, the raw answer to it is I don't think this council can take you where you want to go. They're not on the same page. They're not on the same journey. You've seen that. I mean, the truth goes through three, three phases. You know, first, it's, it's, it's violently opposed, then it's ridiculed until it becomes self-evident. And it's self-evident that this group of councillors has such a preordained and determined prejudice against the airport that I just, I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm telling you the truth, and that is I don't think they can take you where you want to go. You're going to do 12 months. That's what we've got. We've got the War Act being repealed, and Mr Stokes and Mr Crouch take a bow because you guys generated it, the Minister um, for Planning and, and our terrible state member, Adam Crouch. They were the architects of getting this going. I mean, I'll blow my trumpet. I, I got on the ear of the Premier at a function and I, I really I really did my elevator pitch as hard as I could for the 20 seconds I had her ear and I just said, oh, you've got to call this in. The one thing you do for the Central Coast is call this damn thing in. That was about eight months ago. She's done. Oh, yeah, Councillor, I, 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 I think back to that council meeting uh, in which we were all in attendance and we, we stood up in defiance of the... Uh, the mayor at that meeting. Uh, you're a send, naughty boy, you're not the messiah. <laughs> uh, to, send, to, send, to send a message that mm. this was a very important issue for the aviation industry. And I guess the headline for this particular uh, panel discussion was really about successful advocacy. Uh, and uh, I would be quite interested, I'm probably going to start with Andrew, I'm going to come back to you on this, Councillor, but Andrew, successful advocacy is really about using all of the tools that are available to you. And in some cases, advocacy is going to be um, the brute force uh, media. In some cases, it will be a delicate diplomacy behind the scenes. In other cases, it's going to be an industry-wide petition. I mean, this particular challenge that the Aero Club has been working towards has been one that's going on for many years and has taken a, a broad range of disciplines to bring to a uh, position where we've at least got the successes that have happened today. What's your reflection on how we drive successful advocacy on these issues? Yeah, well, as you said, it's, it's got to be multifaceted, I think. I mean, um, the general aviation industry is not a huge industry. It's a little bit niche compared to some other industries. So we don't often have the numbers um, that, say, the Transport Workers Union might have or something, for example. Um, and um, if it was just the Aero Club board, members and staff who were upset about the way we were being treated at the airport, um, I don't think we would have had the result that we've had recently. So um, we had um, some people in council, uh, Greg Best, uh, Councillor Best, uh, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Pillen and others who saw the uh, worth of the airport from, from day one and were very helpful in raising the profile of our concerns. Um, state government were very good and noticed early on um, that uh, the, the, the community weren't happy about the airport. But um, we, obviously, as a board, um, we raised the issue uh, publicly as well when we had to. Um, we, our, our intent was never to create division or arguments within council or within the community, but we just had to show the community that we were highly concerned with the way we were being treated um, by council with some aspects of, of the site. Um, now, I'm just going to reiterate that um, those um, sort of days of angst, if you like, are, are sort of behind us now. Communication, rather, has been quite good recently. Um, and, and I can only hope that that will continue. But, yeah, the, the campaign itself was multifaceted. So uh, we had the, the media involved. Uh, councillors like Councillor Best were very helpful. State government saw our plight. And AOPA. Uh, so I will blow your trumpet for you as well, uh, Ben. So the AOPA membership were very good. Um, they've all obviously got a, a commitment to aviation, especially general aviation. Um, and we had a lot of helpful um, emails, um, 
you know, Facebook commentary going on from AOPA members. And I understand that uh, when we had our um, our petition campaign, uh, there was a lot of heavily invested sort of commentary from AOPA there as well. So I well, thank you, AOPA. Well, look, it's it's certainly a campaign that's been led by the Aero Club. And Michael, you know, obviously the Aero Club and, and what I see across the industry uh, is on these particular issues, there's this really fine balancing act. I mean, the, you know, I, I can I can list out a whole list of Aero Club. I won't do it now, but Aero Clubs where they've, they've been really wronged in situations with airports and airport management and local councils. You know, you, you are balancing a very fine seesaw of the interest for your club and also wanting to, to cut the throats of those that have really sought to undermine aviation, undermine your business, undermine your flying community. I mean, how do you how do you successfully navigate that? How do you balance the interests of your club but at the same time be a firm advocate? Yeah, I think um, a lot of clubs are under, undergoing similar problems at the moment, Ben. Um, you know, if you look at, at Redcliffe, for example, they've got a council, I think, up there that doesn't really understand aviation either. Um, but I think the council, the councillors now are aware of the support in the community that we have. Uh, and that came out of our last campaign, out of the, out of the uh, petition. Um, it's also come out of things like the Economic Development Survey. That was a document put out um, which didn't mention the airport. Unbelievably, if you look at what Councillor Best just said about it being important for the, for the development in the area, it didn't mention it. 57% of the people who responded to that um, mentioned the airport and said the airport was an important piece of infrastructure. There was no place for them to do it other than in general comments. Why do we have a survey like that that then it doesn't pick up that, that point? Yet the general public did. But the, the people of the Central Coast picked it up and said, look, this is important to us. We know it's important for emergency services. We know it's vital for RFS. We know it's vital for police. We know it's vital for Medivac. We know it's vital for, for ambulance transfer flight. All those things are key issues to the community. And the community wants to see the airport preserve all of those things. So I think council, you know, the councillors that are against this um, and are suddenly now aware that and the community does support it. And we've got an election coming up. So, you know, we're hoping everybody's going to play nicely because the last campaign will come to overdrive if they don't. Well, I have no doubt that the looming election will certainly bring out new challenges uh, for the Central Coast Airport. And I, I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Best that I think that the battle the battle is still raging and it, it, it's still got a distance to go. Uh, but I really hope that what the council can do is to find a way to move beyond the fact that there are some disagreements uh, and try and focus on the things that everyone does agree on, which is that this airport really is uh, and can be a strong economic driver and employment driver and future potential driver for uh, people on the Central Coast. I mean, Councillor Best, uh, I'm trying to remember the saying you had on this, but I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it back to mind, but it, it generally moved around the basis that you, you've got to kind of step up to protect what you've got, otherwise people will take it away from you. Um, I know you and I have had a lot of conversation on, on the fact that we need to be able to engage and we need to be able to mobilise not only our aviation industry, but also our, our local communities around airports so that local communities understand the full value and the utility and the need for these airports. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of bushfires and emergencies where suddenly airports become a critical gateway in allowing medical supplies and other emergency services in and out. How do we get stronger traction with the people of the Central Coast for them to understand the value of this airport so that they too become loud proponents of not only protecting but promoting a strong aerospace and aviation future for the Central Coast? Well, look, that, that's a, a really important um, aspect, Andrew, and I draw on my two decades um, working with the community, and I think the answer is actually in this virtu virtual room, and you've seen the Aero Club, and Andrew, to his credit, um, you know, had a number of open days and what have you. Um, you know, take a bow, our board, take a bow, Andrew, engaging your community getting the community to own. As you gentlemen touched on earlier, it's it's not about a, a few people recreating and learning to fly. It is such a valuable community asset that 
you know, it, it's just something that we've we've got to. The old term in local government is people power. That's what you're striving for, and and it is about the people. It is genuinely about our community, and we're talking about the aviation constraints of our current vision. But as I said earlier, just imagine taking this fast forward. What does this airport going to look like in 50 or even 100 years' time? I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible to we people sitting here today. But I do know that it, living between Sydney and Newcastle, it's incumbent upon us to make this thing a winner. You know, as, as, as my, one of my favourite movies says, you know, Apollo 13, failure is not an option. We must prevail on this airport. And I thank you people for all the work you're putting in and as we go to September, we need to genuinely put in place people that actually get it, people that want to work with the community, not people that just come in with preconceived ideas and want to howl everything down. The moment this council was elected, they were pulling the rug out from under everything. The damage on so many levels. I mean, you've all seen in the news Terrigal of Wombrell Beach. I mean, you'd have to live in a cave not to have seen that disaster. That is just such an avoidable disaster on that beach, costing millions of dollars now and so much heartache and the loss of homes. When those people pleaded with this very council, the same councils tried to trash your airport, they pleaded with them to put their own protections into the beach and they said, no, you can't do it. Bad luck. Planned retreat. Greens. Just, just walk away and watch your house fall down a cliff. That was on the same night this very council gave itself a pay rise during COVID disaster. These people just don't get it, and we have well, to move in September. It reminds me of one man with an excavator. <laughs> one man with ben. an excavator taking matters into his own hands, frustrated yes, that ben, government ben doesn't Weber. Ben, ben Weber is a local ben hero. Weber. Big yeah. shout-out to Ben Weber. Well, yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully the aviation industry doesn't have to go that oh, far. Oh, and oh. I, <laughs> I certainly am not promoting that, and uh, I think we want to try and keep it nice and controlled. But I... I tend to agree with the guys uh, from the Aero Club that the future is one where there has to be this really strong working relationship. So, look, guys, understand everyone's been short on time. The purpose of tonight, we don't normally broadcast on the Thursday nights. Our, our Facebook live streams are usually on Tuesday nights. Um, but obviously, Councillor Best, you're heading into a council meeting on Monday. Mm -hmm. Now, on Monday, you're bringing your motion before the council and you need a little bit of support to help with that. What exactly do you need? Oops. Absolutely, Ben. Well, look, from, from yourselves, from Andrew, a communications of three minutes, a letter, gentlemen, that can be read out and will be read out in the chamber, just highlighting the, the views of the Aero Club and the airport community and just highlighting the fact, the need for the, the, the review to be taken seriously and to be expedited. And I prosecuted the argument this afternoon on a Zoom meeting with the general manager and senior staff only two hours ago about the vegetation issue, and I was extremely direct with them, and it's all being recorded, um, because I am really concerned about seeing trainee pilots, 16-year-olds, come into council, plead with council, like an, a clip out of an Oliver Twist movie, please can I have some safety, and for council to say, we're gonna form a committee to determine whether we're gonna trim trees at the end of the runway, while unfortunately uh, a trainee pilot's hanging up in a tree or worse. Um, that's got to be echoed into the chamber again on Monday night. Now, Andrew, you and I have stood before council and we've discussed these safety concerns as we see them, and I don't believe uh, there are many people within the aviation industry that would tell you it's perfectly safe to have trees growing up into the approach paths at airports. Uh, what is the update with that situation? I mean, it's now been some time since we stood before council and outlined that we were concerned. Has this safety concern been addressed? Are there any movements? Well, the trees are still there um, and, and haven't been trimmed so far. Um, I have monthly meetings with um, the unit manager in charge of the airport. Um, and what I've been told is there's several layers of um, state and environmental legislation uh, governing the, the corridor of those trees. And, and it's very difficult for council to know which way to go to trim them. Um, I'm not overly happy with that answer. I think that the pilot safety trumps uh, any of that legislation. And I know there are ways around that when there is an imminent risk to human life. Um, uh, so um, after we, we, we've seen the review results and the review went beyond 
its uh, purview, if you like, and actually commented on the safety of the tree line on the approach to the runway and recommended that council attend to it uh, as soon as they can. Um, I have no doubt that um, that council will react to that. So uh, Councillor Best said that they've just spoken about it. Um, we have an upcoming meeting with the mayor um, where we're going to be discussing our new agreement uh, and the future of the airport. It sounded very positive when we spoke to the mayor um, and I have no doubt that it, uh, after the uh, findings of the, of the review that it will be positive for us. Um, but certainly the tree lines, I guess, will be discussed uh, quite firmly at that meeting. And, uh, and I can only hope that um, they have something in the works very soon, if not immediately for us, because it, uh, you know, it's, it needs to go. The, the, tre the trees need to be trimmed. Uh, we're all on the same page with that. Uh, it's, it's difficult to have, find anyone who will even admit to the tree lines wanting to, should, should remain where they are. Even the people who are anti-airport um, usually find a way around admitting that they want the tree lines to stay where they are. So I'm sure that we'll get a resolution soon. Councillor Best, uh, obviously allowing these trees to grow up into the approach path is just, it, it's lunacy at best. These trees were uh, maintained and pruned for decades. Uh, there was no impact on wildlife. There was no impact on the wetlands. There was no impact on uh, residents. There was no impact on cars and traffic. There was no impact on anyone. Uh, the only impact there was was a positive safety impact in that it kept the approaches to this airport safe to be used. I mean, what's your take on on council allowing this situation to evolve or develop? Look, I'm fairly straightforward in, in what I believe to be the truth. And this is just typical of what I've been saying through this whole discussion. This is uh, uh, a, a clandestine um, plot, I hate to use the word, it sounds a bit nutty, by these extreme green people to white end the airport. If you constrain the OLS, you all know what's going to happen. You'll be landing on a postage stamp and then eventually you won't be landing. I mean, it's something out of a, a Dr. Evil skit, you know, of nonsense that these people have dreamt this up. And if they force the vegetation closer to you, then eventually you'll give up and go away. That's what we're up against. And this afternoon, I won't say exactly how I couched it, but I made it abundantly clear to the senior staff my concerns about this and what it might ultimately leave council and the ratepayers in, 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 in the position of if something catastrophic happens. And I was told that um, it's, it's being hamstrung by state legislation. Well, on this, this phone two hours ago, I texted some very, very senior state people and said, tell me the truth. Is it your state legislation that's holding up these trees being pruned? And I'm waiting for an answer on that machine tonight. And if I don't get it tonight, I'll call them in the morning. Because it's, it's this, it's past the parcels. Whilst a trainee cadet pilot is, is, is near clipping trees coming in. I mean, is that, is that the best we can do as, as, as the, the senior people running this community, having kids and, 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 and expert pilots like Andrew in fear, giving advice, and God forbid we end up in a catastrophic outcome. I won't even mention what that looks like. But here we are at one more There's a real hypocrisy going on here, and that oh. is... Uh, you know, I grew up in a local government household and, and with a father that was involved in local government. And so what I can tell you is that if a local council had even the slightest or remotest thought that a tree over the top of a path on any urban street was a potential risk that it could drop and fall yeah. on a child sure. or an adult, they wouldn't need an approval. They go in and they no. prune that tree and they maintain it because the safety of the residents, the safety of the constituency comes first and I think uh, Andrew and Michael we you know we work inside of an aviation system that is all built on safety and we are reminded at every turn it is about safety and I guess there must be a little bit of frustration from your sides that a safety issue such as this can actually occur and we can get stuck in this paralysis with no uh, no outcome in sight. Yeah well look I would just like to say there is a quote um, I should have brought the uh, got the page in front of me out of the um, the review of the um, Warnervale Airport Restrictions Act. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a quote there where the reviewers um, basically quote from um, a report from CASA, I believe it was, where it, it states that there is no um, federal or state legislation, uh, environmental legislation, that can trump um, safety with respect to aviation flight paths. So 
Um, I'll have to find that again, and I might uh, forward it to you, Councillor Best. But um, thank you. Uh, that that um, is quite telling. That um, the, the federal uh, Civil Aviation Safety Authority has recognised that um, having a, a clear approach path is is more important. Not that um, you know environmental legislation isn't important, but it's more important that than um, you know fifteen or twenty. Um, the tops maybe five, ten metres of 15 or 20 trees. Um, Michael, so you're a lawyer. <laughs> I'll jump in here. You're a lawyer and we all love lawyers. We really do. <laughs> I love the ones that work for open and don't charge us. <laughs> and we won't quote you. <laughs> but, but as a lawyer, as a lawyer, you know, I imagine you must look at this situation with, you know, perplexed to a degree that we have this National Aviation Safety Regulator that clearly takes aviation safety very seriously and we are all too often reminded of everything we can and can't do because of the express explicit letter of the law on safety do you find it confounding that CASA as the safety regulator hasn't intervened on this and been very clear in saying that that approach must be maintained yeah they they uh, they're concerned about it we know that um and if you go to the point of, of the legal reasons why it can't be trimmed, I don't think there are any. We have we have given council um, our views as to what path there is to this. And as Andrew said, there are several aspects of safety legislation which trump everything else. We're not seeking to knock the trees down. We're not seeking to do anything with them other than to trim them back to the flight path level and keep them healthy and growing forever as far as we're concerned. Um, so there's no impediment to that. The consequences of not doing it and having an accident are, are extraordinary and they'll be terrible for council. So we just want to get this problem fixed. We want to have our students feeling comfortable. We want to have our pilots feeling comfortable and our members comfortable when aircraft come in. We don't want to see air ambulance crash where it kicks the trees as it comes over with the gear. You know, this sort of stuff is completely unnecessary. Well, as I've raised in those council meetings that I attended, uh, regardless of whatever concerns the council may have for its environmental uh, ideologies, I'll phrase it as Councillor Best, uh, regardless of those ideologies, there is an explicit duty of care that these yeah. councillors and council staff have. And if the tragic outcome were to, occur, were to occur, and God forbid it never occurs, but if it were to occur, these people would be answering to the coroner and I dare say that they would be mightily exposed given the fact that everyone has made them very clear that that uh, exposure is there. So, Councillor, I hope that Council comes to some sense on this issue uh, and obviously maintains the trees because, after all, you know, as has been outlined by both Andrew and Michael, this, this is an aero club with an enviable safety record. The Central Coast should be incredibly proud of having an aero club that takes safety as seriously as, as they do and and behave and project themselves as professionally as they do. So they're a real credit to the Central Coast. And, you know, I know we've harped on this a little bit. Maybe that encouragement there, Councillor Best, that let's get a working relationship happening here on a huge scale because there's a lot of good that can be done. Gentlemen, thank you, everybody, for making the time to speak with us this evening. My final question to everyone before we wrap up this session is, and I'm asked this question all the time, what can the participants of the industry do? What can a recreational pilot, what can a private pilot, an aircraft owner, an aviation business person, what can they do to help in these particular situations? Do they write letters to the council? Do they write letters to council laws? Do they write letters to the local member on the Central Coast? What should they be doing to express their support for both the Aero Club and for the future of the airport? We'll start with Andrew and we'll work our way around the room. Um, it's probably... Um Oh, I suppose, to being on the fence a bit, but all of the above, I think um, that's how we raise the profile of our problems at the airport. So um, writing to councillors uh, and council um, are very important if you feel strongly about an issue you don't think is correct, um, writing into the local papers, etc. cetera. Um, joining advocacy groups, so joining the Aero Club itself is a good way forward because um, we're on the ground at the airport and AOPA, who look after general aviation in Australia, um, so uh, that's probably the, the most sensible thing to do is just sort of um, spread the attack, if you like. Uh, Michael, what's your so what I'd like to see, Ben, is... What, do? what I'd like to see is all of those industries, that those GA industries would like to relocate to 
a place like Central Coast and who put in one of the 34 expressions of interest under the old plan, I'd like to see them write to council and remind council of what they can bring to the area. Again, this is not going to change the profile of the airport. It'll remain a GA airport. It'll remain for light aircraft. We're not doing anything unusual here. But that would immediately give us an injection of skilled labour for our local youth and for our for the people of the Central Coast. It would be the start of a wonderful um, thing for the Central Coast if we can get that up and running. Just write to council and respectfully remind them about what you can do with your business at, at Waterville Airport. Absolutely, and uh, let, let AOPA Australia be at the top of the list of beautiful new multi, uh, multi-use multi-purpose aviation centre, which we could be using for conferences for the general aviation industry bodies, the recreational bodies. Imagine if we could be hosting the annual Sport Aircraft Association conventions and doing all this wonderful stuff on the Central Coast, so close to Sydney to take advantage of all the tourism stuff that Sydney has to offer, but also taking advantage of all the wonderful beaches uh, accommodation and everything that the Central Coast offers as well. This has just got, it's just got good stuff written all over it. I wish we could be doing it. Councillor Best, your take. How can our industry mobilise to help you and other councillors that are supporting a strong future for the aviation industry on the Central Coast? Look, all of the above, all the suggestions that have already been made, absolutely, tick a box. However, I, I, I hate to contra, contradict the good book, but the meek aren't going to inherit the earth. They just aren't. You've got to you you've got to own this, folks. Who whoever and wherever you're from who's listening, if you want a future for this region's aviation, then you need to not be on the fence. I don't say that negatively, but you know Australians tend to you know chill out a little bit when it comes to a, a political um, activity or view. I'm not a political animal. I'm independent. Three kids, love the coast, lived here, you know, 35, 40 years. Um, you know, it's a blessing to live here and, and I just can't be a passenger here. And I don't think anyone else in the in the aeronautical industry can also afford to be a passenger. So come September 2021, well before that, you need to get in touch. You need to talk to all the right people that, that, that care and genuinely support what are the honest views of this aviation community going forward. Because if you sit on the sidelines, if, you, if, if we can, you've come five minutes to midnight, and you all know it, of this council putting a resolution into that chamber to sell the airport. You've come five minutes. You have no idea how close you've come for that resolution. And 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 you maybe have dodged a bullet this time. And I say maybe because because there's some cut snakes in this, this council now who don't like what's just happened and don't be one bit surprised, gentlemen, what might actually come from somebody who's cut. So, and I say that with all frankness and honesty, these people are not happy with the outcome of the democratic process of 939 people and 75% of them saying they want the War Act reviewed. The airport is owned by council. Council, with eight votes, can vote to sell the airport tomorrow. It's that simple. That's how quickly it ends. Is anyone going to get involved in September 2021? I ask you. I think you will. We will. Every single one of you. I'll give you absolute assurance that uh, we are 100% committed uh, to supporting the Central Coast Aero Club. They're a fantastic organisation. The Central Coast Airport is lucky to have uh, the organisation and the people behind it. They do a fantastic job. They are literally some of the best ambassadors for our aviation industry, and I just hope that we... Uh, one day we'll see a council that fully appreciates and understands just how fortunate it is to have such passionate and dedicated people uh, up there representing aviation. And it is really a true credit to you, gentlemen, that you have stuck it out as long as you have and you've been measured about things and you've worked systematically uh, to get to where we're at today. Obviously, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you making the time to inform our members and give them an opportunity to more intimately understand exactly what's going on. These Facebook Live panel discussions are, you know, COVID, COVID-19 COVID has forced it on us, but it's actually a brilliant medium. It allows the AOPA Australian membership and the broader aviation industry to have a direct and meaningful understanding on issues that otherwise might skip through. I know Andrew... I really have to say I commend you on the communications that were developed throughout the various stages of the campaign. 
you did put together a really powerful documentary piece uh, that conveyed in such clear and concise terms what was going on and the value of what uh, was at risk of being lost, which was fantastic. But again, th I think that these are doing the same with that and I think that we should be doing more of them going forward. And it's an open invitation at any time uh, for the Central Coast Aero Club to participate in this level of conversation. And obviously the issue is not won yet. The battle is still going and hopefully it's probably waning down a little bit and we move towards that more conciliatory uh, completion. But if things don't necessarily head in the right direction, you do have AOPA Australia's uh, undying support because we want to see aviation on the Central Coast for many decades to come. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ben. Thanks, ben. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, and for Thanks, our Andrew. listeners and our viewers out there, that closes out yet another great Facebook panel session. Uh, if any of you have feedback or you have questions that you would like to ask or you'd like to put to any of the panellists, if you'd like to put them in the comments, we'd be more than happy to pass them on uh, and ask that they get answered. Uh, we will be back again next Tuesday at 7 p.m. with our next uh, panellist, and uh, that's set to be a doozy. We've got a great story about a helicopter pilot that had her helicopter rammed by a property owner intentionally. Uh, it's a very sad situation where that helicopter owner and her passenger were put at risk, uh, and there appears to be very little action by CASA in the follow-up from that to provide uh, any accountability for someone intentionally seeking to interfere with aviation safety. Stay tuned for that session and in the week following, we'll be joined by Glenn Buckley. Glenn has, uh, Glenn had a flight training organisation down in Victoria that was quite publicly put out of business by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority uh, through a range of investigations and actions. We'll be speaking directly with Glenn and hearing his side of the story uh, in that following week. So thank you very much everyone for your continued viewing and we'll see you again very shortly.